thanks so much for the invitation to be here. This is a great pleasure. And I've uh, um, never been here before. I've been in, in Rio uh, several times already. Um, but uh, it's a pleasure to be here and at your institute. Um, what Hanata told me was that there aren't many people here who are familiar with the details of active galaxies. So for my first talk here, I'm going to go through the properties of active galaxies, how they were discovered, what isn't an active galaxy, because some things could be misconstrued or misinterpreted as being active galaxies. And so I'll try to get to an overview or high level introduction, and then in the subsequent talks, we will introduce a lot of boring detail. Okay, so first, um, what do we see here? This is a very nice, by ground-based, taken from the Earth. Can you hear me okay? Fine. Let's see, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. I don't need this, do I? <laughs> I'm noted to be very loud. It's not as nice as an accessory. Um, okay. So this is a ground-based image of a nearby active galaxy. This is NGC 4151. They all have interesting names like this. And this is, again, you can see where it was from, courtesy of Adam Block. And basically what you see here, if you're familiar with galaxies at all, this is a pretty much face-on spiral galaxy. There's another one in the field right here also. But this is NGC 4151. And what you can see is you can see some fairly tightly bound, wrapped spiral arms and some fainter extended spiral arms. <clears throat> if you can believe this shape here, this is a barred spiral, if you know about galaxies. There's a bar in the center. And what is interesting here, which was really the subject of this talk, is the bright stuff in the center. And so this is not resolvable, but just shows up as a very bright central part of the galaxy. And that's where all the activity occurs. So when we talk about active galaxies, we're really talking about active galactic nuclei, the very center regions. And so the galaxy is the host of this horrible parasitic thing that has the potential to destroy it. Okay? So you can look at this in more detail. Um, so I come back one. There we go. Okay. From space. And this is a very uh, interesting image uh, produced by a woman named Judy Schmidt, who is an amateur astronomer, not a professional. And what Judy does is she takes uh, images from the Hubble archive that are taken at different wavelengths or different energy bands and assembles them to make a composite image of this. And so this is a blow up, if you will, of the ground-based image I showed you before. And this is the inner 10 kiloparsecs of this galaxy. The galaxy may be, you know, 50 or 100 kiloparsecs across. So this is the inner regions. And so you can see also there are these spirals here. These are not the ones that from before. This is close up. And you can see this clumpy, bright stuff there. That's stars. They're young stars. But once again, we're getting very close in here to the central region. Um, these are taken at different wavelengths. The looks brown or red. That is in the near infrared. And that's dominated by old stars and dust. Um, the blue in here, that's the region. Could be young stars, but also the region of activity. You can see this region of activity here. You can see these spirals of, of, of dust. We call them dust lanes around there. These are important, and I'll talk more about that later. But here you can see the overall picture. Now, this is just in what we say visible light. And our bias in understanding active galaxies is that we see things in visible light. So the way we look at these and the way we classify them initially was all done based on their visible spectrum. But they're interesting at other wavelengths as well. Why did I do that? I not know. OK. So here, pardon me for that. This technology is very hard to work with. <laughs> um, this is another image of the same object, MC 4151. But this is a combination at different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. The uh, blue here, in this case now, are x-rays taken as an image with the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And this covers a range from probably 
about uh, 500 electron volts to about uh, 10 uh, kilo electron volts. So that they, they composite the full X-ray spectrum. Uh, the optical uh, light, visible light, is taken here uh, with a one meter uh, captine telescope in La Palma, and that's showing up as yellow. You see some of that. And then there's a red. This is radio. This is from the very large array, showing radio structure in this. And this is probably uh, atomic hydrogen gas in the radio structure. So you can see in here the same kind of extended pattern. The orientation is not the same, but this extended pattern is shown both in the optical and in the x-ray. And that traces us back down to what the active part of the galaxy is. OK, so active galaxies have some words. They're basically originally identified on the basis of, even though I've shown you x-ray and radio, on the basis of optical spectrum. And so what you see when you look at an active galaxy are emission lines. And I hope you're all familiar with emission lines in various different contexts. And um, what you see is things from typical common elements, hydrogen, helium, and things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. There are other elements as well, usually not quite as prominent in the spectrum. Uh, but there are lots of other things in the universe that produce emission lines. So basically, emission lines are going to be produced whenever you have excited gas, either ionized gas that's recombining or hot gas that's producing lines by collisions. Um, and in the 19, before the 1920s, everything that wasn't obviously in our galaxy that looked fuzzy or nebulous, cloud-like, was referred to as a nebula. So it was not known whether these nebula were inside of our own galaxy or in or somewhere outside. There was a great debate as to whether they were part of our our own galaxy or island universes, which uh, was thought off this idea by philosophers in the 18th century that they were island universes. Um, so there are a lot of objects that aren't AGN: planetary nebula, uh, H2 regions, which are regions around young stars, and uh, Galaxies can be dominated by the radiation from these young stars and the ionized gas around them. And if they've had a very strong star formation, these are referred to as starburst galaxies. So let me show you some examples of things that are not active galaxies, but are emission line sources. Planetary nebula. This is a very nice image. Again, this is Hubble HST taken with the wide field uh, camera, the second one that was put on. This was put on in the 90s. And this is the uh, NGC 2392. And if you like fanciful names, I think this is called the Eskimo Nebula, which you get, guess looks like an Eskimo if you have a great imagination. <laughs> um, and it's different colors. The red here is singly ionized nitrogen. The green is Balmer data. Blue is doubly ionized oxygen. The violet is actually uh, doubly ionized helium, which is seen in planetary nebula. By the way, just as a note, these brackets around you, if you're not familiar, these are uh, quantum mechanically forbidden transitions that produce these. And these things were first discovered, these emission lines, by looking at objects, by looking at nebula, because they can't be produced in, in, in the Earth. And certainly, even now, with the vacuums that can produce in the Earth, you don't get these lines because the quantum mechanical rules mean the transition probabilities are low. So they get collisionally de-excited before they radiate. So you have to have very low density gas in order to see these lines produced by radiation. And so they put brackets around. Matter of fact, this one here was first found in planetary nebula in the 19th century. They didn't know it was oxygen, and they called it nebulium because it was found in a nebula. But you can see this structure around here. And uh, again, the central star in the planetary nebula is down in here. You can see the dot. And as we'll find out, that's sort of playing the role that the inner nucleus, the accretion disk and black hole in an AGN play, of producing the ultraviolet radiation that ionizes these outer gases. And so, um, and these central things in here are quite hot at 10 to the 5 Kelvin, which means there are a lot of photons produced. It's basically a black body, but it's hot enough that you have a lot of photons and energy is enough to, to double the ionized helium. That's more than 54.4 electron volts. So again, if you look at this, you might think it could look a bit like an active galaxy. And here's a spectrum, a very nice round-based spectrum from Zhang et al. 
Uh, I think this is VLT. And uh, you can see all these emission lines. I don't know if you can read the identifications. But if you look over here, uh, 46, 86, this one here, it's doubly ionized helium. So to make this requires very energetic photons. And you can see there are lots of them, but there's this thing to note about this. Uh, this is a very high spectral resolution spectrum, but the lines are very narrow. And that's one of the characteristics here. So you have a lot of ions from high ionization species. There's uh, iron 5, that's quadruply ionized iron, and oxygen 3 again here. But they're all very narrow. And so you can see that. So that's the characteristic spectrum of these guys. There are other things that are emission line sources, again, that are not active galaxies. This is a, a image, another Hubble image, of a H2 region. That's a star forming region surrounded by ionized gases in something that should be familiar to all of you, which is the large Magellanic cloud. We don't get to see up north. And here the red is H alpha, and the blue is singly ionized oxygen. And all these things here, these are young stars that are ionizing those gases. And so this, because you've got ionized gases, again, is going to produce an emission line spectrum when you look at it. And indeed, here it is. And so um, there are lots of narrow lines identified here. It's interesting, these are lower ionization lines than what you produce in the planetary nebula, because these young stars, although they're very hot, are not as hot as the cores of a planetary nebula. That's the inner part very close to where the star was producing uh, energy by fusion. And so even though it's in its late stages and fusion is shutting down, the heat is very high at the core and can be 10 to the 5 Kelvin or more. The temperatures of the photospheres of these young stars are more like 5 times 10 to the 4. So they lack the very energetic photons that could doubly ionize uh, oxygen in most cases and definitely helium. But you can see, once again, the characteristic here are these narrow lines. You can see various species identified here. By the way, we'll talk about this more later. You can see that some of these lines are produced by recombination because here's the hydrogen Poshin series. And this is the recombination cascade of the Poshin series showing up in the spectrum. So some of these lines are produced when atom ions recombine and the electron drops down and produces emission lines. And some are ions that are sitting there and are excited by collision and then radiate. So they're both in this spectrum. Now, if you have a galaxy that has lots of these star forming regions, you can produce a line that looks like a composite of all these H2 regions in the galaxy. And this is one of these, a starburst galaxy. It's NGC 3110. And again, lots of star formation. And once again, you get these narrow lines. These are an oxygen three doublet. This is Balmer beta here. This is uh, Balmer alpha with some nitrogen lines combined. This happens to be sulfur two if you're interested in such things. And you can see, once again, lots of emission lines, but they are narrow. Okay? So that's the thing to keep in mind. And here's a nice picture, by the way, of the same galaxy in the G311 oh, from uh, Hubble imaging. And you can see the bright, the uh, white light there, that's the young stars and spiral arms. There's some stuff in the core here, but if you remember the thing of 4150 when I showed you, the contrast between this core and the outer parts is a lot less. So there is some radiation in the core. It's mostly old stars in this, hence the, the more reddish color, the older populations of stars. The young ones have all died off, so the cooler ones are left to make it redder. But it's, it's there because of the concentration of stars, but not really prominent, like look was in 4150 when you see these beautiful spiral arms. Okay? So this is a starburst galaxy. Again, something that is an interesting uh, subject altogether, but outside the scope of this. Now, active galaxies have been known for a long time without people knowing what they were. And so this is from a paper from Lindblad, Lundmark and Lindblad in 1919. It was in the Astrophysical Journal. This is, I think we're in volume like 20,000 now. This is volume 50. And um, you can see there are spiral nebula with these strong emission lines. If you look at a regular galaxy, it looks like a composite spectrum of all the stars in the galaxy. 
Most stars, their spectra are dominated by absorption that's produced in the star's outer photosphere and chromosphere. So you see an absorption line spectrum with some kind of average black body <coughs> uh, below it. Okay, so if we took a spectrum, say, of the Milky Way galaxy, that's more or less what you'd see. If you look at the Andromeda galaxy, you can see. But some galaxies, they didn't even know there were galaxies in 1919, were identified. Here's one. I know you can read this in the back. NGC 1068, according to FAF, this shows bright emission lines. The FAF reference was from like 1915, but I couldn't find it. But this one references FAF, and there are some peculiarities about the wavelengths of light um, that make this object unique to all these other emission line sources that were uh, identified in this paper by Lundmark and Lindwet. So they don't even know if these things are in our galaxy at this point, but they know there's something strange, something peculiar about them because of their emission spectrum. So, if we go on in history a bit, it was in 1943 that this guy, Carl Seifert, was working at the Mount Wilson Observatory. It's an observatory that's outside Los Angeles in the United States, and therefore, because of the proximity to a big city, it's not a great scientific use. And of course, it was supplanted by Palomar, the first very massive telescope, a 200 inch mirror, which is now also kind of obsolete. But uh, at Mount Wilson, uh, and this was, by the way, during World War II, so he was taking advantage of there were other people of the fact the city was black out, the lights were off. So war is really good for him. <laughs> As a side note, the first white dwarf was discovered by Alvin Clark, a telescope maker, during the Civil War. So wars are good for bad for other things. We're good for astronomy. <laughs> so here is a bunch of these. Here's the NGC 1068 that Fab was talking about. And here is our friend NGC 4151. And another one, NGC 3516. So what Seifert found out is, yes, we see emission lines. Here's the oxygen three line we talked about before. Here's Balmer beta. Here it is in another source and another source. But the difference, they're broad. They're extremely broad. That was noted by Fath and uh, Lundmark and Lindblad way back, also noted by Seifert, and he classified these things as a separate kind of object. By the time we get to Carl Seifert, we know these are other galaxies, because it's after Hubble did his work, after the great debate between Curtis and Shapley, which determined whether we were seeing things inside our galaxy or outside our galaxy. So now we know we're looking at other galaxies, have some idea where they might be, how far away they are, and you can see they have these peculiar emission features. And they're very, very broad compared to what we've seen beforehand. So now we know it's an emission line source, but it's something different than what was detected before. We know they're different galaxies at this point, but we know they have these interesting emission. Um, so, that was detecting them as AGN by Seifert based on their uh, optical emission. But there's other ways, as I showed in that picture that showed radio and x-ray from NGC 4151, there's other ways to detect these things and note that they are active galaxies. And that's by looking at other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And one of those would be looking in radio. Now, um, historically speaking, the British were the first one really to do much with radio astronomy. And a lot of the technology for that was developed once again, war is good for astronomy, was developed in, during World War II for radar. And that became available to astronomers after the war. And so, again, the first real surveys of the sky and radio were done at Cambridge University in England uh, starting in the early 1950s. So they didn't know what these things were, but they looked, they looked at the sky, they found radio sources, and they cataloged them. And so the various uh, CR, Cambridge radio catalogs, that were developed there. They actually used the inter an interferometer to do these. Some of these things, like 3C48, 3C273, they identify as a different class of object. And the quasar is sort of a acronym for quasi-stellar radio sources. So they're like pinpoints. They're not identified as things that have structure. So you could take a radio telescope and look at one of those H2 regions and you'll see structured radio emission around there. But these were pinpoints, unresolved points. 
Hence, they were quasi-stellar, because at this point, the stars were not able to be resolved spatially. And so this is in the 50s, and it wasn't until the early 60s by Sandage and Matthews that they found an optical source at the same point where this unresolved radio thing was. So now they have it in two different parts of the spectrum. They have a radio detection, and they've identified it with an optical detection. The fact that you've made an optical detection means that you could take a spectrum of it. Okay? So one of the things you can do with spectra, as I'm sure you all know, is you can see how what things are made of, or how hot they are, or how dense they are. But you can also figure out if they are uh, cosmologically redshifted objects, if they're moved by the expansion of the universe, where, how far away they are, just by looking at the shifts, the Doppler shifts of the lines. Uh, so all but the nearest objects are all redshifted due to universe expansion. In this case, Martin Schmidt looked at this People looked at the spectrum initially and said, what is this? We can't identify any. We have more nebulium, for example. We couldn't identify any elements. It turns out it was hydrogen recombination lines that were shifted by about 15%, which corresponds to a large velocity. Um, is this due to them being very far away? Because these would be more far away than any of the galaxies that Edwin Hubble saw in the 1920s that had shifted emission. These are much more shifted than those. And so it led to a bunch of uh, unique people like Arp and Burbage, other famous dead astronomers, that they didn't believe these things were cosmologically shifted. That this must have been thrown out of nearby galaxies at very high velocity. Why they were all thrown in one direction was something of a mystery. <laughs> It turned out um, there was no connection between nearby galaxies and these things of the sort that are converted. There's actually other connections with nearby galaxies due to lensing that we're not going to go into, but ARP and Burbage were completely wrong. And these things really are at these large distances in, in, inferred from the redshift. But how are these connected to Seifert galaxies? Are they the same sort of thing? So now we've got optical identification, optical identification of a radio source. And we have these optically identified emission line things that um, Seifert found. So keep that in mind. There are other things that you could do in the radio that have to do with active galaxies. These are radio galaxies. These are general. There are many of them in, in the nearby universe. And they tend to be in clusters of galaxies. And they are phenomena that are usually in old stellar population giant elliptical galaxies. So there's not much going on in these galaxies. However, something in the very center of them is accelerating particles to like 0.9 or 0.99 times the speed of light. These particles transverse that move out into the host galaxy. As they do, they interact with the galaxy's uh, medium. And synchrotron radiation is produced. So non-thermal radio emissions produced. And there are various sorts of these things. This is a, a a X-ray uh, radio, an optical image of a jet in uh, M87. It's a nearby very powerful radio galaxy. It was the first one, by the way, where the jet was found in X-ray and in, in optical. <coughs> Most of these jets are found only in the radio. And you can see it's got a lot of structure, a little blobby, you know, condensations, cloud condensations, and submission go out. Again, this is all synchrotron radiation. The physics of this is not really yet fully understood. It has something to do with acceleration of electrons and positrons near a very heavy, dense thing we're going to talk about. Uh, why they occur in these kind of galaxies and what conditions they're produced in is not all that well known. There are various types that were classified by Karnhoff and Riley back a long time ago and had to do with the structure of the jet and whether it had two sides, and whether it was brighter in the center or brighter further away. Not really very important. Uh, these FR1s like this, they're jets in 80% of them. FR2s have jets, but they're more luminous. They have something to do with the cluster they're in. These ellipticals are found in clusters of galaxies. And so it has something to do with that. But again, the real details of how the jets produced are not well known. I would point out, I'm going to talk about black holes uh, next time. This is the guy, this is the one that the black hole so-called image was made for. 
So this is M87, and the uh, Event Horizon Telescope was able to produce an image, not of the black hole, but of the region around the black hole. Because why can't you take an image of a black hole? Because they're black holes. <laughs> All right, so now, here's some more pictures of, uh, of radio sources. This is, uh, so now we've got these FR1s and FR2s. How are they, are they related to active galaxies? Well, they are in the sense that we think that the engine is the, is the same thing. But sometimes you see these things in quasars. And this is the quasar we talked about before, 3C273. This is from a fairly recent paper, the Very Large Array um, in New Mexico. is a radio interferometric array. And they can map the jet to various different frequencies. And you can see the extent of this thing goes quite some, some way here, starting at some particular source and extending outwards. That's what the source is here. It extends this way. So this is, the, this is now a quasar. This has emission lines that were identified by Martin Schmidt as red-shifted hydrogen, but is also showing up here as a very powerful radio source on light, like these FR1 radio galaxies. So you now have a radio source and a quasar together. There's other kinds of things. I mean, there's a whole menagerie of different classifications of active galaxies. And here's another one. These are called blazars. Um, there's a nice review by uh, first Meg Urey back in 1998 of blazars. And blazars come in different classifications of high and low power with these names and acronyms I'm not going into. They can be radio selected, that is detected in radio, or x-ray selected. They emit at all wavelengths. This radiation is again synchrotron radiation or synchrotron radiation with some Compton effect added in. And here is a spectrum of uh, you know the uh, flux versus frequency in these guys. And this is in the radio range. This is kind of EV or UV, and this is X-ray going up to gamma ray. And where these things peak, this uh, dashed line is one type of source, and this line is another type of source, determines their classification. It turns out that this radiation is produced by, I showed you the jets before. This is a jet pointed at us. So we're looking down the jet. And there's a couple of reasons we believe that. These things exhibit superluminal motion. So blobs of radiation in the jet appear to separate at faster than the speed of light. But it's a time delay effect that produces that. It only happens if you happen to be looking straight down. Again, so you're getting a projection effect that's giving you this phony uh, idea that things don't faster than the speed of light. And the other thing is um, the power is boosted. There's a Lorentz factor in this radiation as things spiral in magnetic uh, fields. And so the, the beam is more powerful directed at you, the way the thing is going, than along the sides. And this Lorentz boost, it makes these things very powerful. Um, other than that, they're not really very easy to study because the rest of these are emission line sources. There are emission lines in these blazars, but they tend to be very weak. And that may be the orientation of the system, again, that we know about from the jet that makes it hard to pick out these sources. But again, another form of active galaxy. Um, so you can divide AGNs into things that emit a lot of radio or things that don't. And so, because astronomers like to classify things, they determine radio loud versus radio quiet. This goes back to Kellerman. And they look at 4440 angstroms as in the optical part of the spectrum and six centimeters is a wavelength in the radio. And they take the ratio of those two, and if it's bigger than 10, it's loud, and if it's less than 10, it's quiet. Um, there are other features about this, which is that radio loud ones are much more luminous in the radio than the radio quiet ones. So not only is this factor bigger, they're much more luminous. But it turns out that most AGN are radio quiet. 90% or more of them are radio quiet. There's a nice paper recently by Anessa et al. shows that. And here are some examples here of radio quiet ones. This is our friend NGC 4151 yet again. And you can see there's this extended radio structure. It varies differently in you know, wavelengths. It goes out many hundreds of parsecs. This one even larger. And this other, uh, this is it'll both see for galaxies, Mercurian 6. And in a star forming galaxy, I said each two regions can produce radio, but it's just kind of amorphous rather than a jet. And you can see that in this star-forming galaxy in 
what makes things radio loud versus radio quiet, again, seems to be something connected with the central engine. The lack of radio loud ones means it's probably a temporary state. So at some point, things are radio loud for individual objects, and at some point they're not. And again, at some point they maybe only can produce radio emission and not any of the rest. It has to do, we're going to find out, with the structure perhaps of the central system of these things, which, can, which contains a massive black hole and an accretion disk. So that's probably why this is. But the radio loud ones are interesting, but not all that common. So um, there's a related phenomenon. These are not really active galaxies, but a related thing. And these are luminous infrared galaxies. Um, Soifer all defined these back in 1984, and they're luminous infrared galaxies. The U means ultra luminous infrared galaxies, and the HY means hyperluminous infrared galaxies. And here's some pictures of them. The, their main connection here is they are gas rich mixtures. It's a lot of molecular gas, and they produce starbursts. Remember that starburst galaxy I showed you initially? Did you see 3310? This is star formation on a much more massive scale. And a lot of it's coming out as infrared radiation, reprocessed. And this is in terms of the luminosity of the sun. So 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 times the power of the sun. So an extremely luminous thing. An active galaxy, like an NGC 4151, is probably more like 10 to the 10, and not just in rust across all wavelengths. So these are extremely powerful in the infrared. Uh, here's a nice picture of two Zwicky 96. I'm sure you're all familiar with that one. I wasn't until I found this picture. And you can see these are merging things with different regions of, of stars here. This is the, high, the greenish color and regions of hydrogen gas are the red. And here is a uh, mosaic or you know uh, display of different kinds of these things. And the main thing here is they may have an AGN inside. Some of them might, some of them might not, but they all seem to be part of merging systems, which tells us a lot about the evolution of galaxies and may tell us something about an AGN or connected with galaxy evolution. So before we go on, uh, things that I've been talking about, sort of review a few physical parameters. I've been mentioning luminosity. That's just the power output. And if you integrate it over everything, you get the bolometric luminosity. The spectrum uh, can have physical, different physical origins at different energies, but the continuum is just referred to as the spectral energy distribution, or SED. Now, if you look at this, what you're really looking at in producing the emission line gas is photons that have enough energy to ionize hydrogen. And so basically, if you have some luminosity is a function of frequency, you can just integrate that and see what the total amount of ionizing power you have. And this is something I'll get into more detail on this in the third lecture when I talk about photoionization. So now, uh, as we're going to find out, we're talking about accretion onto a supermassive black hole. And so how do we get that? So we're trying to figure out how you get the power. We can see by the spectral energy distribution what that radiation is going to do to the gas in the host galaxy. Remember, we're living inside a galaxy and doing things to it. So again, a parasite and a host, if you want. Uh, but one of the ways you can look at that is the conversion of mass into energy. And so you know the famous formula, mc e equals mc squared, right? So if I know how you're getting equivalence of mass and energy, well, what they like to do here in this field is that they, they use that formula with not mass, but the rate at which mass is accumulated. So this m dot is the time derivative of the mass. It tells me how much mass is approaching the black hole. And so the amount you can get from this relativistic kind of concept is m dot c squared times some efficiency factor, which you make up. It's not 1, something very much less than 1. So um, how are you getting that energy there? What's making this? Well, the most efficient way to make any kind of thing like that is by converting gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy and finally thermal energy. So the idea here is you have gas in the galaxy. It somehow loses angular momentum and 
spirals towards the center potential of the galaxy. In the process, that potential energy is converted uh, to kinetic energy and thermal energy, and that's what's powering this. And so you can look at it from that point of view, and you can look at this gravitational luminosity, and this is the gravitational constant G, the mass of the thing that's accumulating the mass, that m dot, over some distance. The distance here is where it ends up. If you assume it's come from infinity, that's the final distance here. And so generally, eta here is about equal to 0.1. Uh, if you equate these things to the typical black hole mass, the thing has to get very close to the black hole to produce radiation without efficiency. So it comes from a long way away. It gets to very, very close in. And that gravitational potential energy then is converted. And we see it reprocessed by the material around the black hole, the stuff you saw in the image of M87, the accretion disk, into radiation that comes out and ionizes and affects the rest of the galaxy. OK? Any questions? Just interrupt me. I don't forget what uh, now, more physics types of stuff. What are we looking at here? We look at one of these spectra. I said you can see recombination and collisionally excited lines. And the thing in the upper left here is just a energy level uh, diagram for uh, hydrogen. And all those lines there are transitions made during the cascade. So essentially, the electron is recaptured at you know, n equals infinity in the continuum, and then cascades downward, and therefore a series of emission lines are produced, like that passion line spectrum I showed you in NGC 3110. You can see here there's all sorts of nice quantum mechanical rules here, like changes in the angular momentum that have to be obeyed. But a lot of the stuff that we see here are not recombination lines, but are collisionally excited transitions in elements that are not hydrogen and helium. Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, for example. And here is a partial energy level diagram doubly ionized oxygen, the one I showed you in various spectra. And you can see the wavelengths in uh, angstroms are listed here. And these are the transitions. And these are forbidden transitions that don't obey this particular quantum mechanical selection rule. That means that when you excite one of these, it's going to stay there a lot and not radiatively decay. Okay? If it was high density gas, an electron primarily, would come by, and there would be a Coulomb interaction between the electron and the ion. And the energy would be transferred to the electron, and it would not escape the nebula. If the densities are low, it's enough time for these transitions to occur, and that energy will escape the nebula. That means that these type of transitions regulate the temperature, because they're taking the electrons Electron excited this, so they're taking electron kinetic energy, converting it into radiation, and the radiation escapes. If the density is too high, you shut this path off because they collisionally de excite. And then the thing works much less efficiently as a, a barometer, if you will, or something to control the barometer that controls the uh, temperature. But you see these, so even though these are trace elements, I mean, they're thousands or ten thousands the amount of this that you have of hydrogen. They dominate the cooling. So in a nebula like this, the heating is primarily, this is the gas around, it's being affected by the radiation from the AGN. It's heated by ionization and then cooled by these collision excitations. So now getting back to Seifert galaxies, there's a lot of stuff in here and I'm not going to read through it, but they're basically about 2% of spiral galaxies are Seifert galaxies. Yes, sir. Uh, cool, uh, cooling process are, is more effective. I'll get to that. Thank you. That's perfectly I didn't ask him to do that. He just did that. <laughs> okay. So what you see here, um, these are basically identified as spiral galaxies, like NGC 4151. If you look at their continua, you see broad emission lines like Seifert found. Usually the spectra are featureless. They're not like stars. As I noted, they're strong X-ray sources, the radio quiet, which I mentioned before. The infrared, they're strong in infrared, but it's usually cosmic dust in the interior parts of this has been heated up and irradiates that radiation. Okay. So now, 
Uh, there are two classes of secret galaxies, which um, they gave, they thought very hard to call them class one, type one and type two, as opposed to type one and type B. But in any case, these type ones have broad, very broad permitted lines. So thousands of kilometers a second if you fit a Gaussian to them. The full width half maximum is thousands of kilometers a second. The forbidden lines, when I was talking about they're important for cooling, are narrower. Um, the continuum are decidedly non-stellar. There's another type called type two where you have narrow permitted lines and forbidden lines, but the continuum is dominated by stars in the host galaxy. Now, they thought these were different classes, but spectral polarimetry results, Antonucci was the first one to do this, found that you could, there's a hidden region in the type twos. There's material, I talked about infrared being dominated by dust. Well, if that dusty gas is in your line of sight toward the center, you can't see it anymore. So that you see is type two, and you only see extended gas. It's in that, to answer your question, it's in that extended gas where the densities are low enough that these collisional coolants are most important. They become less important in the denser gas if you get closer to the center part where the energy is produced. And here's a spectrum of a couple of them to show you the difference. And this is again optical spectrum. And this is in, why do I like NGC? These are the two closest that are bright. Um, I was telling you, uh, I'm, to, uh, I'm up to paper number 20 on this one. It's my favorite. I only have about six or so on this one. In any case, <laughs> in any case uh, you can see again these very broad lines. This is uh, hydrogen beta. This is a, um, helium two. This is hydrogen gamma. And these narrower things are oxygen lines in the spectrum. Here is NGC 1068. And you can see the permitted lines like H beta and helium two are narrow. They're about the same width as the uh, um, forbidden lines. Although interestingly, these forbidden lines are broader in 1068 than they are in NGC 4151, and that is an important point that I will hopefully get to in the fourth lecture. So those are the differences in the spectra. And if you want to look at it in more detail, this is a full coverage from the UV to the near infrared of 4151. And you can see there's a myriad of lines. This is taken in a different state than the previous spectrum. The gas close in that makes the broad lines is close enough that it varies in response to the level of uh, power of the active galaxy. So the gas will recombine or ionize as the source uh, becomes brighter or fainter. And so when it's in a faint state, you get less emission from the gas closer in. The stuff further out, due to two factors, one is light travel time, and the other is that the densities are low, doesn't respond quickly or at all. And so when one of these type 1s is in a low state, you can see the extended emission produced by this lower density gas much more clearly. And you can see all these various different lines in there, including some fairly high ionized states of iron, iron 6 and iron 7, and stuff like that. So very interesting spectrum. This goes all the way to the UV. This was done with the uh, Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph on Hubble, which has this kind of wavelength. But you can look at them in the X-ray. 4151 again in the x-ray, it looks somewhat different. These are dominated by the continuum. And here you can see various different states. This is the from Chandra and the uh, Newton XMM x-ray telescope. Uh, the, the one to about 7 keV spectrum, NGC 4051. You can see this varies a lot. Uh, it's a combination of the strength of the continuum and the effect of intervening gas along our line of sight absorbing that radiation. And this sort of variation is what caused that variation or drop in the uh, flux of the broad lines that I showed you in the previous one. It was in a low state because when that was taken, the center part was in this state. So there were a lot less ionizing photons. And so that varies a lot. And I'll get a bit what you can do with this sort of variation. This can lead to measuring the mass of black holes. I'm going to talk about that a bit tomorrow. All right? And this, by the way, is an iron, I should say, line there at, at uh, 6.4 keV. And this is very interesting in terms of determining the properties of accretion disks. So there's a lot in that spectrum. Um, and if you look at a type 2, it's essentially 1068, instead of having the center source dominating the emission, it's the extended gas. Once again, these are 
X-ray emission lines, and many, many of them, in an uh, XMM Newton observation of 1068, and shows all these lines, but not much of the continuum, because that's hidden by dust and gas. This is an extended region. You can also go look in the infrared if you like. And there's various types of secret ones in the infrared, and they look different. You can see there are very characteristic differences between these. See these two here versus these two? This one particularly? The difference is star formation. This extended, and I'm sorry you can't see that, but well, beyond 50 microns, this is the micron scale here, that's uh, dust associated with star formation, relatively cool dust. So ones that lack a lot of star formation, like 4151, lack that piece. So they look very similar when you look at optical light, but very different in the infrared, because the infrared is giving you more information about something you're not really seeing in the optical, and that's the effect of the stars. So once again, how do we get there? Um, this is the basis of the spectral polarimetry by Antonucci. It's, they find a very revolting image that he's put together. But you can use your imagination to decide what that is. <laughs> Uh, this is a big molecular dusty cloud, in spite of what your imagination said it might be. <laughs> Knowing Antonucci, he probably thought of both things at the same time. Uh, inside here is the continuum source, and all these Ds around here you can hardly see. These are these dense clouds that produce only permitted line emission because their densities are so high that the, the forbidden lines are suppressed. So why can't you have low-density clouds close in? Well, you could, but they'd be so highly ionized, you'd never see these ions that produce radiation. So to produce Balmer lines, you need much higher density if you're close to the source. And here's another diagram of this. This is from a paper by Yuri and Padovani some time ago. And here's the disk, and there's these clouds. There's this region out here, and this region out here, and some kind of jet that could go through these. And this is referred to, this inner region, this region has the broad line region. Remember the spectrum I showed you, those lines were broad. We think they're broadened by just Doppler motion, virialized motion close to the center potential. The things from this region is referred to as the narrow line region because the lines, the forbidden lines in the type ones and all lines in type twos are narrow. There's a lot of motion, but it's not velocities as high as we get in the broad line region, hence the narrow line region. And that narrow line region can extend out to a uh, a thousand parsecs, a kiloparsec from the center. The broad line region is usually measured in light days. So it ranges from like maybe five to a hundred light days. It's so a very, very compact region. Of course, that can't be resolved. The broad, the narrow line region is a resolvable thing. You can take images of it. Um, but not everything is just because of your line of sight through a big molecular torus. As I talked about with LERMS and ULERMS, there's an evolutionary process going on here as well. And so things, if galaxies merge, they're going to activate stuff. And so this is a picture of ARP. That's the same ARP we didn't believe in cosmologically redshifted spectra, but we did take, name a lot of stuff. Uh, and here's a uh, emerging pair, or actually three galaxies. And you can see what happens when they merge. All this blue stuff is new star formation that is produced by the, the merger itself. And you have these separate galaxies here. These are not yet having their nuclei activated necessarily, but they might be. Um, so there might be an, I'm sorry it's a little bit blurry, but it does show you the evolutionary sequence. You can start out with individual galaxies. Uh, so you, then you can get a merger that produces a LURG or a ULURG. Eventually, the material that's produced in that gets blown away. I'll talk about that on the last lecture. And you get a quasar, or some kind of active galaxy that you see, one of the things we see. And eventually, it becomes a dead galaxy, an elliptical galaxy like M87. So this is a possible evolutionary merger sequence, which has nothing to do with the so-called unified model looking through toruses. But sometimes the mergers aren't major. This is a minor merger of a secret one galaxy seen face down. Uh, are carrying 509, and this thing here is real. This spike is just a diffraction spike, but this thing is real. And this is a dwarf galaxy, we believe, that's coming in here and drawn in, and probably involved with feeding the nucleus, and this is a trail of stars that are being formed or pulled out from the dwarf galaxy, and these, by the way, are from ground-based things we followed up with, with Gemini NIFs on this, and that's what the circles are. But 
the rest of it, this is uh, artifact, but this is real. So we see mergers both on the major scale and a minor scale. And so what powers the aging in? Well, what powers an AGN is got to be mass accretion in some place at some level. Um, it's somewhere in the nucleus, which is unresolved, uh, less than a light year across from at, at the best resolution, it varies on time scales of hours. A short variation, by the way, with all the energy produced in a compact region. It's like people like uh, uh, you know, Hawkins and whatnot in the late 60s to suggest that this is powered by black holes. Um, so the only way to, again, I talked about this before, is mass accretion. Uh, and it estimated up to 40% of the energy can be produced, uh, converted into radiation. But basically, these things emit across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And you can see the difference between radio loud, radio weak guys, infrared. This is dominated by reprocessing by dust. Our, our own very biased view of these things, the narrow part of the electromagnetic spectrum, ultraviolet, this is the X-ray stuff. By the way, why are these dashes? It's very hard to detect anything at that part of what we call the soft X-ray spectrum because it all gets absorbed by hydrogen along the line site. I mean, to date, there have only been four AGN that have really quality detections in this range, done with an instrument called the EUVE, and now defunct. There's going to be another one of these, but up till now, we sort of have to infer what's going on here. Out here, you're in the range of, of Chandra and XMM Newton. You can see stuff out here. There's a new star, uh, X-ray observatory. Now, there's a bunch of gamma ray observatories. So across the electromagnetic spectrum, you can detect these things. So here's a very fanciful artist's rendition, again, of what's going on here. With the mass being accumulated, it makes a nice disk, it makes jets coming out of here. Um, so the radiation that we see that produces that continuum radiation that is producing the ionizing photons that affect the gas in the galaxy, well, there's two different sources of that. First off, as the gas accumulates and forms an accretion disk, uh, basically you get viscous dissipation in the disk, and the disk heats up. So you can think of part of the radiation as a series of approximate black bodies that are dropping in temperature as you get further out from the central gravitational potential. And that probably produces much of the optical and ultraviolet radiation in these things. Once you get out to the X-ray, though, something else happens. And they infer that there is a corona of mildly relativistic electrons, things that are like 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 Kelvin, that lie above and below this disk. How are those heated? Like, how's the sun's corona heated? <laughs> Same problem. It's, it's magnetic. There's some magnetic heating. I mean, in, in English, magnetic and magic share the same letters. <laughs> so when anybody says magnetic, it's just because it's magic. So here um, is a, the black hole, a very, very uh, stylized disk. And the disk is hot, produces ultraviolet and uh, optical photons. These hot electrons then produce the X-ray radiation we see by inverse Compton. So they upscatter the uh, photons from the disk. So that's what we think is producing things. And there are reasons to believe the disk is there, other than just the image of M87. We'll get to that more in a bit. And so now we can go back and see what, again, just to review where we are. Uh, this is our other close friend, NGC 1068. Uh, which is the only Seifert galaxy that has a Messier catalog number, for those that like that kind of stuff. It's Messier 77, if you, if you like that sort of thing. <laughs> um, so here it is. Again, it's a spiral galaxy. I think actually, it's a barred spiral, uh, fairly open barred spiral. Uh, this is a, a, I guess, a ground based image. Um, and there, the region of activity there is defined by that okay, that uh, box. <laughs> we can go into the box, and inside the box is what you get. So inside the box, you can look at it with Hubble. This is all inside that box I had in the previous one. And this is the region of activity here, with uh, blue being stars, red being H alpha. And green being O3. Why do you put the red 
I borrowed this slide from a colleague of mine. Why he said the red and blue and blue. I have no idea. It's a strange guy. Uh, maybe he's red, blue, color blind. In any case, the green is the oxygen three we've been talking about. And this is a type two. So this defines, again, what your question was. This is the narrow line region. The, the black hole system is down about there. So this is all low density gas. By the way, this red stuff is associated with star formation further out. So it's hydrogen alpha produced by star formation. This is like a cone shape, if you have an imagination. And you ask, where's the other cone? It's a, it's a, is it a monocone or a unicone? The other, it's a galaxy. The other cone, you can see it faintly. It's on the other side of the galaxy. So the gas and dust in the galaxy absorbs the radiation from the opposite cone. As a matter of fact, if you look at this in x-ray, you can see the other cone better. But this is all you know, ionized radiation. Uh, I mean, ionized radiation that produces all this oxygen emission. And uh, there's a lot of gas inside this one. It's in it. Apparently, a very early state of activity. It's been very heavily fueled, not a lurg or a ulurg, but something fueled this one. And you can go even further in. That's Hubble at a. At a this is actually taken with a rocket three, and you can see the structure in here is a more detailed thing than what we saw in the yellow in the previous, in the previous one. And this is a bunch of different blobs of this. What defines this structure is something working on actively. And this defines the position of an entrance aperture that's used with STIS. But you can see the scale here. This is about 300 parsecs across. So you're really very far down in. And remember, the actual active part of this thing is really And then you can take a spectrum of it. And that's what we got through that slit. And this is oxygen 3. And this is H beta. And you can see the lines are split. What's happened is we see gas that's moving towards us and out of our line of sight as the gas expands out from the nucleus. And this is defining a, an AGM wind. And I'm going to talk about that on Friday as well. You can see also faintly the continuum source. This one's bright enough that some of the reflected light can be seen directly and not with this polar imagery. And uh, again, the structure here does not show up uh, because the gas isn't uniformly distributed. Uh, Steve, the, the left one is also uh, a matter component. Okay. H beta, 03-4959, 03-507. And artifact. You see, goes that. You can actually look at this in it's sort of interesting in a way that when you get out here, things don't look like they're shifted. It's a little hard to see. And so these winds seem to not go that far, but the effect of the radiation can go out and ionize gas fairly far away that's just rotating around the center. But once again, how am I doing time wise? Okay. I make it done quicker than that. I can leave out the verbs and go. No, no, no. It's the opposite in Portuguese. Leave out the nouns. Just use the verbs, right? <laughs> Don't need any of that stuff. Okay. So, um, so a bit more about fueling of AGN. And uh, again, we talked about mergers and that sort of thing. But there can be fueling that's just internal to the galaxy itself. It doesn't have to merge. If there's gas in the disk of the galaxy, and you somehow can get that gas down to the central potential, and it can be form an accretion disk, then you have an active galaxy without devouring your neighbors. Okay. So here's some examples of this. And this is from a paper by a guy named uh, Rajesh Bay, <coughs> 2009. And I don't see you can see these are Hubble images. By the way, the two things. Each row is the same galaxy. This one is the same as that. This is the same as that. This is the same as that. And that's just a blow up of the upper row. And this is taken at about uh, 6,000 angstroms. So it's Hubble imaging. Before, I showed you what's called narrow band imaging when you're sending on emission lines. When I look at the structure of the stars, you can use a wider filter. So this is wide band imaging. 
but at Hubble resolution, so you can see the details. And so what you see here is interesting structure. You see these rings and bars? These are structures that show you something is happening dynamically inside these things. And so to produce, that's a ring of, of young stars, called the starburst ring. And, so, and that bar, that's a solid body rotation of stars. As these things move around, they, because they're in the bar in particular, not distributed uh, symmetrically, they'll disturb gas. Once you disturb gas, you can take away angular momentum, and that gas can spiral in towards the central potential and feed the AGN. You don't need a companion to merge with you to do this, so you can do this totally internal to yourself. Although how the ring and the bars are made, that's another story altogether. That may require some level of interaction. But once it's in place, it can fuel itself without, uh, if there's gas in the disk of the galaxy. So when you get further in, you can see these things. These are great, straight images. These are called structure maps. And it's a way of if you have a bright source in the center, the light gets spread out. And it's, it's basically PSF, if you heard that, the point spread function of the image. But there are ways to deal with that if you understand how the point spread function of the image is created for the detector you're using to eliminate that and see what structure is left. Once you've eliminated the thing that should be relatively uniform, the absence or excess emission from what's left over will show up. And you can make these structure maps. These are from a paper by Pogge and Martini some time ago. These are structure maps of various Seifert's. These are all uh, mostly Seifert ones. These would show that very bright thing, like in 4151. So you need to take that out to see the structure. And you can see there are these patterns here. See, like little spiral patterns like that. Okay. And in this case, um, the bright things in here is kind of reversed. The dark regions, uh, bright regions are enhanced stellar light, but the dark regions show you the dust structure. And so what we think is that there are structures here that can be traced by dust, which traces back to molecular gas that's part of the fueling flow. So these things, like this set of here, if you could look at these in more detail close in, you'd see stuff that looks like this. Closer in than these rings or these bars, this is what's going on. And so the gas seems to fall in uh, along, these, along these particular paths. So this is from a paper by a colleague of mine named Travis Fisher, who's at the US Naval Observatory now. And you might have met Dr. Fisher yet. In any case, this is a picture of, uh, that he created, or he created with him, of uh, a Seifert 2 galaxy called Narcarian 573. And it's about the inner kiloparsec. And he's showing in this picture what he thinks are the structure of the disk of the galaxy. And then these are these lanes of dust that I showed you on the previous image. What happens is the light from the uh, active galaxy produces a cone of radiation, an illumination cone. Now, if you go back to the picture, the very strange picture from the Antonucci paper with the big blobby things, you can see that would collimate the light. So the radiation can't get through that structure, so it comes out in a cone-like shape. So if you have gas that's in the plane of the galaxy and it's happily rotating around, nobody bothering it, but it walks into the, the, the spotlight here, then it gets ionized. And so this clumpiness that we see of the narrow line region is probably can be traced back to these dust spirals, which are not uniformly distributed. And as they go in, they are ionized by the radiation from the AGN. So this is, a, again, a diagram of how this works. And that forms this extended narrow line region. So the point here is we're seeing the active galaxy affect its host. The parasite is doing something to the host, if you like. But also, the gas that we have in the broad line region is from material close to the AGN is very connected to the fueling, the accretion disk and everything. The narrow line region is not connected to this at all. It shows what happens at larger scales. Now, as I'll talk about, 
on Friday, this larger scale thing is really the important aspect of what AGNs do. So we believe that AGNs, but the, the engine of an AGN, the black hole, exists in all massive galaxies. It's an engine, right? Engines need fuel. Sometimes it's fueled and sometimes it isn't. Once that thing is fueled, that radiation is going to go out, as you can see in this diagram, and affect the galaxy. Now that radiation, not only does it ionize gas, but it produces pressure. So the photons impart momentum to the gas. The other way you can do this is with these jets that are produced. So something is taking energy from the inner AGN and depositing that in terms of energy or momentum into the host galaxy and has the potential to drive all this gas out. And so this is something that is referred to as an active galaxy or AGN feedback mechanism. So as you fuel the center region, it produces radiation or jets that will stop the fueling. And so this happens on the scale, eventually the narrow line region even further out, and that may affect the evolution of galaxies, depending on when the black holes were created. Yeah? You were talking about the, the feedback process. Yeah. And uh, about your work with uh, Professor Winghurst in 2009. Did I do something with him? <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. Uh, uh, mostly, mostly of this lecture is based on some something that you came up on that time, and I have a, a little question about this about this this work of yours. Sure. Uh, by that time, you came up with three questions, very interesting questions. Oh, this is the white paper. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to that. <laughs> AGN. I never met the guy, by the way. Really. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, one of um, one of the, the questions that you came up with by that time, yeah, was um, um, how uh, the effect of AGN on the on the galaxy host. Yes. Yes. Now that you are explaining about uh, how this affects the the whole environment that right. AGN is put in, could that be the answer for this question by that time? Uh, well, it's it, it's directing us in those in that direction. In that direction, um, the the issue there was, um, and I'll talk about this more later, is there are things we know about galaxy evolution that are not directly explained, and one of those is you can measure the mass of the black hole, and I'll try to explain how we do that tomorrow with a technique called reverberation now. Once you have the mass of the black hole, you can also look at the mass and stars in the bulge. The center read, you know, maybe five kiloparsecs of the galaxy, and they scale. So as the bulge gets more massive and there are more stars, the black hole is more massive. So they're tied in together somehow. So the idea behind that particular project and what we do here is we see, is there a physical process that would link those two things together? And so one idea is that the radiation from the black hole's accretion disk, or the black hole accretion disk system, if you like, produces winds that will drive gas out. Once the gas is driven out, you stop, you stop the star formation. You don't make any more stars. But you also stop the fueling of the black hole so its mass can't increase. So they're, they're linked. And so since that came out, we have uh, a number of projects, a couple of Hubble projects, where we looked at this in because, more detail. Because this one were based on the observations at the UVOI, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, that was an op. See, the thing is, what, we, what we're looking at, that, that's a UV optical interferometer. Yeah. And that was going to be done with uh, satellites flying in, in, in unison, so that you could use the individual satellites in interferometry. You need the disk of radio dishes separated. And optical line interferometry, you're going to hear about that shortly. Uh, but uh, again, you need some separations to baseline for your interferometer. The idea was to use satellites as your baseline for your interferometer. And using that, we could get into these regions where we thought these winds were generated. So regions at less than a parsec from the central potential. On the larger scale, at hundreds of parsecs, we can already see that. We can see the effect of the wind. What we don't really understand is how the wind itself is being generated. 
At the time that we did that, we thought that the gas that we were producing in the narrow line region all originated close and was being pushed out. But our subsequent Hubble observations and also Gemini, the NIFS observations have shown us most of the gas we see was already there. And so the effect of the radiation, that comes from close in. But the gas that we see being driven out was there, and then it, it was unfortunate enough to come into a cone here and be affected. Now, that's not the whole thing. <coughs> There's other pieces to it than that, but kind of bit beyond the white paper. Yeah? Another question. Why is, I don't know how genetic is representation, but why is the cone so much tilted from the plane of the galaxy in this case? We didn't expect it to be more or less perpendicular? Um, there's actually, a, in fact, uh, some work was done like by that in the early 2000s, uh, mostly by uh, Inika Schmidt, working with various people, to look at the orientation of, in this case he was looking at the both the optical in terms of the O3 and the radio with the post galaxy. And he found out that there was no connection. They came at all different angles with respect to the host galaxy, but not that often perpendicular. So why is that? Uh, we don't really know why. The idea perhaps is that um, the way the angular momentum uh, of the incoming gas gets deposited, it's not strictly in the plane. And so even if the black hole's axis is aligned perpendicular to the plane initially, if the gas moves out of the plane, it's going to switch the black hole orientation. The other part is that it may be primordial, the orientation of the black, of the black hole, and therefore the cone, and that the disk was, was acquired later, in which case it wouldn't be necessarily lined up with the, uh, the rotation axis of the post galaxy. That, that comes down to the fact that your black holes are formed top down, bottom up, right, in a way. Yeah. Right. So you're saying that there's evidence now that they are formed top-down somehow? Top-down? Well, the, the sense that the black holes are preceding the galaxy. So the, the black holes may precede the disk. They don't precede the bulge. The bulge and the black hole grow together, but the disks are probably accumulated later. They pretty much know now that the bulge is formed first and then the galaxies acquire the disks later. That's just one possibility. But the orientation... <coughs> um, Probably in the plane directly, the axis is not stable. So the stability is going to be somehow directed out of the axis, but it's at all random angles. In this case, by the way, to go further with your question, this is not based on, even though it's a fanciful picture by Fisher, it's not based on just random stuff. What we are able to do with this is we have continuum images of the Post galaxy, both at small scale with Hubble and at larger scale with Sloan. And from that, we were able to figure out what the orientation of the disk is. From looking <coughs> at the outflowing gas and the distribution of narrow line gas, we can figure out what the orientation of that outflow, that cone is. And so this looks like it is because it is like it is. So what happens in this case, part of the illumination cone intersects the disk and part of it doesn't. So we get more emission as the cone radiation hits the disk, but only a piece of it does. And it's not, you know, on the disk like this. If it was like this, if you see what I'm saying with the disk, the narrow line region would be extremely compact. And we do see sources where it is compact, and it is compact because of the orientation. So there is a there is a galaxy that has a very compact narrow line region. It's a powerful Seifert galaxy, and it's because the cone is basically pointed out of the disk. Not exactly with an axis of 90 degrees with respect to the plane, but much closer to that than in this case. So it seems to vary. This seems this is the case for this one, and there are ways to tell. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Happy to talk about it. No, I'm just I'm just curious now because uh, how much I mean the, how much do we trust the models then? Because this would this thing evolve in time or do we constant? I would guess so, but again, we're looking at I mean, how long do you want to live, right? These are snapshots in time, so the only thing we can do is to look at them statistically. Of course, yeah. And so statistically, it finds out that not many of them are pointed directly out, and none of them are, are directly in, in terms of the axis. So they're randomly directed. The question of why, the other part of this is most galaxies grow by mergers, all right? Now, these kind of Seifert galaxies 
probably haven't had recent mergers except the, the funny shaped thing that I showed you before. With the, that's a minor merger that probably happens, but in major mergers they don't happen. And one of the reasons we think they don't happen is that Cfer galaxies are typically in spiral hosts. So a spiral galaxy can't have had many major mergers recently because basically what happened is it ended up evolving into a lenticular S0 galaxy. Now there are some Seiferts that are S0s, but most of them are in regular spirals. So they can't have interacted much recently. That doesn't mean they didn't grow by mergers in the past. But recently not much has happened to them. They're, they tend to be standalone quiescent things. So getting back to what I was talking about before, we talk about quasars. Quasars are probably mostly mergers. To get that kind of power, you need a lot more than what you can get from this sort of these minor interactions or loss of angular momentum type fueling. But they're in the past. I mean, there are quasars that are close, you know, they're to out to red shifts of Z, maybe, you know, 0.1 or something, very near, fairly nearby. But with Seifert galaxies, they're a fraction of distance from that. So when you look at quasars, it seems this is based on very little evidence that the incidence of merger seems to go up with quasars as you go further out. Um, I have one set of quasar twos that I've got uh, data on a, a few years ago, and it's only a small sample. It's like 10 or 12 objects, and I, maybe one of them is a merger. But I'm also on a paper with uh, uh, Thaisa Storky Bergman, who's down at Porto Alegre. And that paper goes out maybe a factor of five more in, in Z, and they're all, all, all but one, same as like 10 or 12 in a sample, all but one of them emerges. Which is kind of interesting. But this merger thing can affect how things are oriented, and, and there must have been mergers in the past. Anything else? Good questions. Thank you. Um, I got another minute or two. Where am I done? Um, minute or two. Okay, I'll talk really quick. All right, getting back to mergers. This is actually perfectly appropriate here. Uh, this is brand new. This is from a paper by, uh, I guess this is because I have no idea how to pronounce that. Thefley? 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 Uh, the second author is Saptipal, and they're local to DC. And this is combined a Hubble SVSS images of a quasar and fairly a further red shift. And you can see a blob there, and a bright thing there, and a bright thing there. This is a Chandra image showing the same three things. And this is a, apparently a merger of three active nuclei. So this thing does happen, but again, it's a higher red shift. And the idea here is that these black holes will coalesce form even more massive black holes. That's one possible theoretical scenario. The other, like Joe was talking about, you get one and the others get kicked out. So just like with planets, you can do that with black holes. And then finally, uh, what drives all this thing? You have two pieces of the puzzle here. One is the engine, the black hole, and the other is the fuel. And the, the, the dance between those two things defines what kind of object got. And so what they've done here is they've looked at a whole bunch of these using principal component analysis. This goes back to a paper by Clyde Boris and, and, uh, some time ago. And you, I talked about radio loud QSOs, radio quiet QSOs, these are objects I haven't talked about before. And we can actually look at fuel supply and can look at the mass accumulation rate versus, again, the ratio of uh, the radiation versus the Eddington limit on the radiation. And these things lie in different parts of these things. And basically the idea here is the characteristics of the AGN depend on the fueling rate and the mass of the black hole. And you can divide these things up. And when you look at the spectra of these things, this is where the eigenvector of one and physical component analysis, you're primarily looking at optical emission line spectrum. You can define these things in different regions on this kind of a plot based on that. But again, this is sort of an advertisement for some of the other things we'll be talking about later. And there we go. Done.